Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, selection. Thank you, CNE News again, and everybody who participated in the process. Uh, I think it's very fitting that you guys picked a uh, Russian guy uh, as a part of the Spy, spy 12 uh, <laughs> theme. <laughs> I don't know whose idea was that. I think it's brilliant. Uh, what I uh, want to tell you today is uh, really something that we've been uh, working on for the past uh, two years uh, in my lab at UCLA, uh, the idea of a total synthesis of hybrid nanomaterials. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, really, this, 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 this premise of total synthesis is that what really is defining my career and the research and ongoing in my uh, group uh, on a personal level. I think I'm a product of a total synthesis of a number of places that I, have, uh, I was born in and then continued my education at UCLA, Northwestern, and then uh, uh, MIT, but more importantly, it's the people who uh, synthesized me and influenced me uh, over these years. I think, uh, you know, the people behind the scenes, uh, my parents, who were probably the first, my successful funding agency, uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, these folks, this is Fred Hawthorne at UCLA, who took me in his lab, and uh, Omar Farha, who was a graduate student back then. Uh, who was my uh, first undergraduate mentor, and uh, I encourage you to see his uh, Kavli lecture later on today. Um, my PhD advisor, Chad Merkin, who was uh, a uh, great mentor, and again, he's giving a talk later on and gave a talk uh, this morning, really talking about his philosophy. Uh, and uh, these folks at MIT, uh, it was a great amount of fun, uh, really learning a lot of new things about biomolecules when I... Uh, uh, joined a postdoc, which was joined between Steve Buckwood and Brad Pantalut, and these are the two young folks that I had a privilege of interacting with during my time there, which is Chi and uh, Kati, and watch out for them. They're going to be uh, probably in the next class or several classes of T12. I, you know, I can't predict that, but I can bet on that. Uh, in any case, um, and the, the other things, you know, given the spy theme and... Uh, I, I wanted to say is that we, I got to thank Putin because uh, if not, if he didn't become a president in Russia, I probably wouldn't be standing here because my family wouldn't, wouldn't immigrate from Russia and settle in the United States. So uh, thanks to, uh, to him and, and, and the associate there. there. Uh, so what my lab is doing is we're interested in um, uh, using inorganic clusters in really trying to tackle the fundamental problems that we perceive are important. Uh, in the materials chemistry, and uh, my lab is doing a number of different uh, things, uh, ranging from catalysis to OLED materials to solid state materials. But the story that I wanted to tell you today is something that we, we started early on uh, in the game, and something that I actually have been thinking for a long time, uh, starting probably at the time when I was a graduate student, is really the question is how to build hybrid nanomaterials uh, relevant to the biomedical community uh, from the bottom up. And so I'll tell you, you know, certain preliminary results that we have accomplished in the past uh, two years. And really the motivation is, is, is I think, is pretty clear, is that uh, we as synthetic chemists, uh, I would say, cannot outcompete yet the precision level with which uh, the, the biology can assemble uh, biological nanomaterials, that is, proteins. And I would argue that this precision is actually extremely important because if you think about it, you really, the protein-protein interactions that occur on a routine basis inside of cells uh, are very precise. And so if you really want to try to tackle these kinds of problems, I'd say that you know, this cartoon representation of a hybrid nanoparticle might not be the, uh, the most advanced way of doing it. And so kind of go, going with the... Pokemon Go analogy, I have my own analogy. Uh, and again, growing up in Russia, uh, you know, you would see this kind of stuff all the time, right? You know, this, this is the uh, electrical circuit. Uh, and it works, it works fine, right? And this is kind of how most of the nanomaterials, they, they work fantastically well. However, when something goes wrong and you're trying to understand what is going wrong, trying to deconvolute the system is very non-trivial, right? And you ultimately would like to be somewhere here. And so this is what we're trying to do in my lab. So 
uh, and really the reason, if you, if you think about the, you know, the classical types of nanomaterials, that is the gold uh, and thiol assembly, uh, where you take a gold nanoparticle and react it with uh, different kinds of thiols. And the beauty of that system is that how easily it can be accomplished, right? You just throw two components together and you have this self-assembly going on. But uh, it's uh, seemingly easy on the surface, but in reality, because this is a coordination interaction that uh, you build the system from, uh, the system is, is quite labile. That is, uh, in solution, what usually happens is that these ligands on the surface can travel around the surface and the system is constantly changing and rearranging. And furthermore, these uh, nanoparticles that are grafted with these style uh, molecules are also very prone to decomposition and actually exchange with other environmental agents. And so really building these systems in an atomically precise manner uh, with a very defined composition like we used to think as organic chemists when we built uh, organic molecules is, uh, is, is pretty challenging. And so the approach that we uh, are uh, uh, using is, is really stemming from something that I learned as an undergraduate uh, working with Fred Hawthorne, and we're using stable, uh, robust uh, clusters. So this is an example of a cluster which contains 12 boron vertices, and you can graft 12 hydroxyl uh, moieties around it. And this cluster is extremely robust because every bond in this molecule is composed of a strong covalent bond, right? Not the gold sulfur bond, which is very weak. So nothing rearranges here under any sort of physiological conditions. What we can do then is we can uh, attach the, uh, these rigid pentafluoroaryl groups around it and create these molecules that, as you can see, they're extremely rigid, sort of spherical-like bowl-shaped molecules. Uh, they're pretty small in size, and they're extremely well-defined, right? So these are, this is a single crystal X-ray structure. So this is a well-defined, atomically precise, cluster-based molecule, which is hybrid. And you would look at this molecule and ask yourself a question. Well, I mean, how is this related to uh, gold nanoparticles? And really, the, the key is the chemistry. If you look at this, uh, these pentafluoroaromoides, uh, they all contain these para-CF bonds here. And... Um, something that we discovered in the Pentalute lab uh, several years ago when I was a postdoc, is that you, these uh, pentafluoroaromoides undergo a very facile reaction with the thiols. And so what you ultimately can do then is you can throw thiols at these clusters in a very similar fashion, and really the, the, the easiness with what, how you do it, you can uh, react them with thiols, and you can actually displace all these para-CF bonds on this rigid Na spherical nanomolecule and create 12 sulfur carbon bonds, which are now extremely robust and strong covalent bonds. And you can monitor this by uh, uh, fluor NMR, which is extremely convenient. So you can run this reaction in situ until you see a full conversion and uh, displacement of this carbon fluorine bond, and you create this, uh, this architecture. So what can you do with this? Well, first of all, you can, as, as any organic chemist, you can play with the size of these clusters. You can uh, create molecules that have extra phenyl spacers and grow them rationally, bottom up. Uh, and because these are now the molecules that are amendable for functionalization with essentially this chemistry is very uh, orthogonal, that is, it only reacts with the thiols at room temperature and no other nucleophiles actually participate in this nucleophilic aromatic substitution, you can essentially graft these uh, uh, clusters with any kind of thiol that you can think of. This is an example of grafting them with PAGs, and you can see that this is an atomically precise uh, cluster that is grafted with 12 PEG units around. And you can convince yourself that by using the uh, either classical nanoscale tools now co to characterize this, like a TEM. And you can also use the molecular tools, like GPC and DOSI NMR, to characterize these things. And this is really stemming from the idea that these molecules sort of come from both worlds, right? They're nanomolecules, and, and yet they're nanoscale-based materials. Um, the other thing you can do is that you can uh, start thinking about grafting these uh, species with uh, uh, molecules that uh, can uh, participate in target binding. In this particular case, I'm showing you a cluster that contains uh, 12 sugar moieties here. The other thing I want to mention is that you can actually do intact mass pack on these molecules. And unlike the gold nanoparticles, again, where usually the sulfur-gold bond is weak and these things tend to fall apart in the electrospray, 
uh, you see only intact masses that correspond to just different uh, charges uh, localized on this cluster. And so this is really the testament of how rob rob robust the system is. And so one key uh, interesting feature of, of these uh, uh, nanospecies is that the fact that you can then endanger the multivalency uh, in, 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 into them. And so if you think about the, this, this protein, uh, it's called cone A, uh, it's known to bind weakly to the, uh, to the sugar, glucose, but the binding is extremely weak. And so you can barely pick it up at the uh, micromolar concentrations uh, using the SPR technology. However, when you uh, express 12 of these units around the uh, cluster, you create a molecule that looks like this, right? And so you can see using the experimental SPR binding measurement that uh, the binding is significantly ampl amplified. And this is due to this pronounced multivalency, as you can see there's several binding sites on this protein, where you can see that this is sort of an octopus effect where uh, one of the sugars binds into the pocket and at this, a point where it decides to unbind, there's a sh second sugar which is in the high level of proximity that comes in and binds and that generates this uh, significant binding enhancement, almost 10,000 fold. And so I think the opportunities uh, in, in really trying to think about how to build these nanomaterials from the bottom up are vast. Because uh, if you think about it, if you wisely use the chemistry, uh, you can engender significantly improved stability of these molecules. These are the molecules that are stable and don't decompose uh, at wide range of temperatures, buffers. They don't react with external thiols, which is extremely important when you want to expose these materials to uh, uh, serum and serum-like media. Uh, and, and another important thing is that as, as with small molecules, you can use molecular precise tools to really track these species and ensure that they're actually intact and don't undergo any sort of a speciation. Uh, and on the side of really cluster chemistry, I think the opportunities are also really wide open. Uh, that is, uh, you, I showed you an example using just boron clusters, but I think there's, and with respect to these, you can manipulate their sizes and shapes using more or less a classical organic synthesis. And there's many other inorganic clusters that I think would uh, uh, benefit from elaboration and really being able to uh, one, take them and interface them with the right chemistry to be able to make nanomaterials that mimic the aspects of the existing classes, but at the same time are uh, benefiting from precise atomic structure. And so with that, this is probably the, the second most important slide, or the first at this point, uh, to the uh, advisors that I thank. These are now my, uh, my group and uh, my co-workers, uh, uh, specifically Elaine uh, Chan, who, who really streamlined this whole entire project in my lab, uh, a lot of collaborators both at UCLA and outside, and uh, these are the funding agencies who are uh, courageous enough to fund uh, what we do. Uh, and again, uh, thank you everybody for uh, having me here and uh, uh, it was a fantastic day and I never gave a talk with this uh, beautif beautiful uh, uh, logo behind me. So thank you again. <laughs>